While we have land to labor, let us never wish to see our citizens occupied at the workbench. We have land enough for the thousandth and thousandth generations. With these words, Thomas Jefferson laid out his vision for the future of America, populated by independent and self-sufficient family farmers. And with his Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson believed that he had provided the nation enough land for centuries to come. But in the years between 1860 and 1900, the nation of small towns, local crafts, family farms, and regional businesses became dominated by huge corporations, enormous commercial farms, and sprawling cities. By 1900, the United States was an economic colossus that produced close to one-third of the world's goods. It had grown from 31 to 76 million people, more and more of whom lived not on farms, but in cities, who worked not for themselves, but as wage earners for others. Jefferson would have been astonished by the changes the nation had undergone. Industrialization had brought about a revolution that permanently transformed the United States and the world. Industrialization was a complex process in which the shift of manufacturing from people to machines brought about a huge rise in production. In the decades following the end of the Civil War, a system of small and regional enterprises was pushed aside by powerful corporations which used innovations in technology, organization, and financing to develop a rapidly growing, highly unstable national economic system. Linking it all together and accelerating its growth was the fire-belching iron horse. I see over my own continent the Pacific Railroad surmounting every barrier. I see continual trains of cars winding along the flat carrying freight and passengers. I hear locomotives rushing and roaring in the shrill steam whistle. I hear the echoes reverberate through the grandest scenery in the world, bridging the three and four thousand miles of land travel tying the eastern to the western sea. When Leland Stanford hammered the final spike at Promontory Point, Utah, in May of 1869, a telegraph carried the momentous news to the awaiting nation. East and west were connected in a single transcontinental railroad. Railroad construction would continue for decades to come. Between 1865 and 1900, track mileage increased from 30,000 to more than 200,000 miles. This effort required huge amounts of money and land. The economic consequences were immense. The railroads opened new lands for settlement by making formerly remote areas accessible to the farmers, ranchers, and mining companies who would pour the natural resources of the South and West into eastern factories and cities of the East. Railroad construction required huge amounts of capital. Money from private investors was joined by generous support of federal and state governments, staunch supporters of expansion and business. The 131 million acres of public lands they received for their efforts included one quarter of Minnesota and Washington, a fifth of Kansas and Montana, and eighth of California. Uh, if you could uh, talk a town or a, uh, a city government into wanting to have railroad tracks, they would lay down new railroad tracks. This stimulated jobs for people in a variety of areas. The railroads forged together a national economy and opened the West for settlement and economic development. It fueled the growth of dozens of other industries like steel, coal, and timber. And it opened fresh lands for settlement and profit. In 1876, the city of Philadelphia threw the nation a big party for its 100th birthday, the Great Centennial Exposition. Machinery Hall was the centerpiece of the exposition, 
visitors marveled at the demonstrations of sewing machines, assembly line shoe production, automatic corn huskers, and apple peelers, and machines to make hens lay eggs. They inspected state-of-the-art harvesters and plows, and watched wood pulp made into paper, and power drills dig holes. At the center of it all, rising 30 feet into the air, loomed the 700-ton Corliss steam engine, which ran all of the exposition's 4,000 machines. From the finite state of our glorious country, it looms up in power, the infinite master of this mechanic world. American technologies and inventions were building an industrial system that would soon produce more goods faster than anywhere else on the earth. Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated his new telephone. Well, in communications, the big news was the telephone. Now people could communicate with each other over distance instantly. So the telephone was something that transformed business, transformed daily life. While visitors marveled at the new technologies demonstrated at the Centennial, Thomas Edison opened the Menlo Park Laboratory that would be the model for the modern business of invention. From his laboratory, he would give the world the phonograph and the electric light bulb. American inventors would file nearly a half million patents between the end of the Civil War and the dawn of the 20th century, transforming the economy and the way people lived. Modern machines, factories, and railroads required vast sums of money that no one person or private group of investors could provide, giving rise to a new form of business, the corporation. People pooled their money, pooled their resources, and were able to therefore make themselves much more powerful than any one individual could have managed uh, on their own. Um, and with that power, they formed large corporations which uh, exploited natural resources and exploited uh, too often uh, the workers who they brought in to do the labor for them. In the past, while the factory sold its goods, what they're doing after the 1880s and 90s is not only selling their goods, but promoting and distributing their goods. Advertising as we know it develops in this period and companies became their own advertisers. Companies also became their own distributors to make sure that the goods got out to the countryside. The needs to have divisions of responsibilities, layers of supervisors, gives us bureaucracy. A large scale, corporately owned, bureaucratically managed work organization. Once upon a time, the opportunity, if it happened, was to become your own master. Now the opportunity is to have a career within a large-scale firm, which you will never own. By gaining control of each step of production, or by taking control of a market for a single product, a handful of corporations squeezed out smaller competitors. Companies began to buy up one another, especially in the 1890s, with the result that many of the companies we know today begin to dominate their fields. Some of them grew large simply by hiring more workers. Others grew large by buying out the competition. By the 1890s, Scottish immigrant Andrew Carnegie produced more than 60% of America's steel. And the Standard Oil Company of John D. Rockefeller, or Rockefeller, as his critics called him, controlled 90% of the nation's petroleum business. They were captains of industry. They did put together the first huge modern corporations. Um, and they organized economic life in new ways that uh, increased the overall wealth of the country. Have not great merchants, great manufacturers, great inventors done more for the world than preachers and philanthropists? Can there be any doubts that cheapening the costs of necessities and conveniences of life is the most powerful agent of civilization and progress? Charles E. Perkins, President of the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad. But at the same time, they were robber barons of, in a way because they took the lion's share of the wealth and they were certainly great uh, conspicuous um, spenders, uh, living lavishly, lighting their 
cigars with hundred dollar bills at lavish banquets and building huge mansions in uh, Newport, Rhode Island and so forth. I am a citizen of the United States, born in the state of Vermont, producer of petroleum for over 30 years and refiner of same for 20 years. But my refinery has been shut down during the past three years owing to the powerful and all prevailing machinations of the Standard Oil Trust in criminal collusion and conspiracy with the railroads to destroy my business of 20 years of patient industry, toil, and money. When George Rice testified before the U.S. Industrial Commission in 1899, he spoke for many others who discovered that big business was no place for the weak of heart. Riches sometimes went to the boldest and least principled, such as railroad speculator Jay Gould, whose corrupt practices sank the Erie Railroad and set off a financial panic in 1873 that saw 5,000 businesses close their doors and a half million workers lose their jobs. Other captains of industry like Carnegie and Rockefeller would become philanthropists, devoting some of their vast personal fortune to the support of education, charities, and the arts. Whether these men did the country more good or harm, there was no doubt that industrialization was growing at a mind-boggling pace. In 1875, we lagged behind the other industrializing nations, uh, most notably Britain, Germany, and France. There was such spectacular industrial growth between 1875 and 1900 that in 1900 we were number one. And we were so far ahead number one that you could take everything that Great Britain produced and France produced and Germany produced together and it was less than what the United States could produce. 35% of all the manufactured goods produced in the world were being produced in the United States by 1900. America's booming industrial economy demanded wood, minerals, animals, and other natural resources, all of which could be found in abundance in the vast lands lying west of the Mississippi. Uh, we had the building of this, uh, what I call an industrial heartland, uh, the movement westward of industry. 1875, most factories were along the eastern seaboard and eastern seaboard cities. And then over the next 25 years, we have the spread of industry through the Middle Atlantic states into uh, the Midwest. To encourage Western settlement and development, Congress passed a series of laws giving away millions of acres of land for a small filing fee and the pledge that it be made productive. Drawn by promises of free land and hopes for a better life, some 10 million people headed West in the decades following the end of the Civil War. By and by, I was smitten with the silver fever. Prospecting parties were leaving for the mountains every day and discovering and taking possession of rich silver-bearing loads and ledges of quartz. Plainly, this was the road to fortune. But they were rough in those times. They fairly reveled in gold, whiskey, fights, and fandangos, and were unspeakably happy. Mark Twain. These were the golden days of the Wild West of adventurous men and women who sought their fortunes on the western mining frontier, of grub stake prospectors striking it rich, hard rock miners buried in cave-ins deep within the earth, and shrewd vendors who built makeshift food stands into lavish restaurants and saloons. The silver and gold dug from the earth provided industrialists with money to finance their activities. The coal fueled their engines. The iron, copper, and lead was transformed into machine parts and consumer goods that poured out of American factories and mills. Before long, independent prospectors gave way to large mining companies. Specially trained engineers oversaw the difficult task of extraction, often performed by Mexican, Chinese, and European immigrants. Americans were voracious consumers of wood, especially the railroads and mining companies, which used more than one quarter of the nation's annual timber supply. Lumber companies chopped and sawed their way across the nation, sweeping from Florida to East Texas and felling the great northern forests of the Midwest. 
then cutting their way through the Rockies to the temperate rainforests of the West Coast. West of the 98th meridian, much of America was too dry to support agriculture. At the end of the Civil War, close to five million longhorn steer roamed the vast Texas grasslands. To turn these wild cattle into cash, Texas ranchers in 1866 began to drive great herds a thousand miles north to stops along the new rail lines, where the steer could be loaded onto trains for eastern markets. The cattle frontier became a land of opportunity for the rugged men called cowboys who tended the herds, ex-Confederate soldiers, Southern blacks, and Mexican vaqueros who spent their money in the rough and tumble cow towns of Dodge City, Cheyenne, and Abilene. A good sized steer when it is fit for the butcher market will bring from 45 to $60. The same animal at its birth was worth but $5. He has run on the plains and cropped the grass from the public domain and with scarcely any expense to its owner is worth $40 more than when he started on his pilgrimage. Americans' insatiable hunger for beef promised huge profits to Eastern and European investors who poured money into Western beef. Cattle ranchers battled Indians, Mexicanos, sheep herders, and farmers in range wars for control of millions of acres of public and private domain. At the end of the Civil War, 11 million buffalo still roamed the Great Western Plains. Within 20 years, they had all but disappeared. From the southern tip of Texas, north into Canada, cattle had become king. But the free-ranging cattle quickly overgrazed the prairies. And when the weather turned mean in the 1880s, droughts and blizzards decimated the herds, killing millions. By the early 1890s, the great cattle drives were all but over. The invention and mass production of barbed wire enabled ranchers to enclose huge areas for their herds, which they drove to stockyards along the new northern and southern rail lines. In the summer of 1871, Mother got hold of some literature sent out by the railroad telling of the glories of Nebraska and how there were homesteads to be taken within four miles of the state capital and the university. She was greatly enthused and urged Father, as we say now, to get in on the ground floor. Between 1860 and 1900, Western farmers put more acres under the plow than had been cultivated in the previous 250 years of American history. The same magic wands of government land acts, transportation, and technology that had developed Western resources into lucrative industries turned the windswept Great Plains and the fertile soil of the Far West into the breadbasket of the world. Offering 160 acre plots to almost anyone who promised to cultivate the land for five years, the Federal Homestead Act of 1862 set off the Great Western Migration. Drawn from their homelands by promotional brochures that boasted opportunities in the American West, two million European immigrants settled on the Great Plains, transplanting pieces of Sweden to Minnesota, Germany and Denmark to Kansas, and Poland to Nebraska. The arrival of the Santa Fe Railroad to Los Angeles in 1885 set off a land boom in Southern California. Within a decade, California had become a major grower of fruits and vegetables, cultivated by the Chinese, Japanese, and Mexican immigrants that the large growers hired to work the fields. New farm implements like the chilled iron plow, spring tooth harrow, and mechanical harvester enabled farmers to produce five to ten times more than before. In the arid west, farmers used new varieties of seeds and dry soil farming techniques to turn dry prairie into waving fields of wheat. The challenges of the west also offered women opportunities not available back east. They ran boarding houses and restaurants, operated businesses, ran their own farms, and entered the professions. The west had more female doctors than any section of the country. The West was also the first region to give women the right to vote. 
The Utah and Wyoming territories began the trend in 1870, followed later by Colorado and Idaho. In the years between 1866 and 1880, Western farmers put 23 million new acres under the plow. But as wheat, corn, and other grains flooded the market, prices plunged. Thousands of farmers couldn't pay their bills and lost their land. Hoorah for Greer County, the land of the free, the land of the bedbug, grasshopper, and flea. I'll sing of its praises, I'll tell of its fame, while starving to death on my government claim. By 1900, two-thirds of the homestead farms had failed. As homesteaders went bust, big growers backed by Eastern and European investors bought up the failing farms and established huge agricultural operations called Bonanza Farms. One of the first was Oliver Dalrymple, who strung together 30,000 acres into a vast commercial enterprise. Using the latest mechanized farm implements, large commercial farmers created factories in the field. The Bonanza Farm represents the army system applied to agriculture. A manager marshals his men, arrays his instruments of war, and with mechanical precision, the whole force moves forward to conquer and extract rich tribute from the land. The development of commercial agriculture and the means to ship the food produced enabled Americans to eat better and more cheaply than ever before. Refrigerated boxcars shipped meats, grains, and vegetables to grocery stores and dinner tables across the country. From the far western lands came grapes, oranges, broccoli, and almonds. The Great Plains offered endless fields of wheat and corn while the South contributed rice, tobacco, and peanuts. But even as Western farms transformed American diets, the rise of big commercial growers began to eclipse Jefferson's dream of a nation of self-sufficient family farmers. As agricultural opportunities collapsed in the countryside, as prices declined in farm goods, more and more people moved off the farms and came into the cities looking for jobs. In a new country, the rapid growth of cities is both natural and necessary, for no efficient industrial organization of a new settlement is possible without industrial centers to carry on the necessary work of assembling and distributing goods. When Adna Weber explained the rise of American cities to the readers of Scribner's in 1899, the United States was in the midst of a great wave of city building. Whereas only 16 cities had more than 60,000 people in 1860, 11 cities now boasted more than a quarter of a million. Chicago's population had doubled every decade, topping more than a million by 1890. Before the Civil War, manufacturing centered in the nation's countryside, along the streams and rivers whose water powered most industrial machinery. Steam engines and electricity freed manufacturers from having to reside near water power. So industry moved to cities, where energy, labor, consumers, and transportation were all close at hand. The huge businesses, whether they are steel plants or agricultural uh, machine plants, uh, eventually car factories, had to be located in areas where there were populations of people and where there could be increased populations of people. And that's why you see these mass production plants siting themselves in existing cities. By the dawn of the 20th century, more than 90 percent of all American production took place in cities. The largest cities were found in the Northeast and Midwest, where industrialization was the fastest. But cities were also growing in the South and West, serving as processing centers for regional industries. Minneapolis specialized in fur, Pittsburgh in coal and iron, Seattle in fish and timber. In the same way that national railroads sparked westward settlement, new innovations in mass transit enabled cities to expand into the adjacent countryside. While poorer families still clustered close to their workplaces, electrified streetcars took managers and other professionals to new residential neighborhoods on the outskirts of town. 
as new immigrants came into the cities, you began to see a kind of segregation between the wealthier people in the cities who had their own sections of the city. More people with more money in their families tended to move outside of the cities into little villages or towns that became suburban areas much later on. It may be a little more difficult for us to attend the opera, but the robin in my elm tree struck a higher note and a sweeter one yesterday than any prima donna ever reached. The streetcars that moved people out of the city brought them back in for business, pleasure, and shopping. Department stores with their alluring window displays, personalized service, and incredible variety showcase the finished products of American industrialization, newly available and abundant consumer goods. Cities themselves became giant consumers of heavy industrial goods used in their construction. Bricks, steel, glass, machines, and wire. At the dawn of the 20th century, the United States was an industrial colossus, a nationally integrated economic system of ranches, farms, factories, and cities. Americans were proud of what they had accomplished and looked forward to a world in which industry and science would soon solve the age-old problems of poverty and human suffering. But progress came with a price. But in the late 19th century, um, this country was hell-bent on um, you know, exploiting its resources um, and, and people getting ahead. So in getting ahead, sometimes they left behind uh, the environment. The destructive agency of man becomes more and more energetic and unsparing as he advances in civilization. He commences an almost indiscriminate warfare upon all forms of animal and vegetable existence around him. When George Perkins Marsh published his book, Man and Nature, in 1864, few people paid attention to his warnings about human threats to the natural environment. But in the following decades, mining fouled streams and rivers with poisonous runoff. Loggers cut so many trees that the nation feared a timber famine. Cattle ranching and farming killed the natural vegetation of the Great Plains, as lush, tall grass prairies gave way to sagebrush and tumbleweed deserts. Hunters killed off the game, wiping out whole species of birds and slaughtering the great American bison to the brink of extinction. These rapidly expanding Americans were so busy growing, um, expanding, uh, becoming wealthier, that they lost sight of how they were transforming Mother Nature and not for the better. So cutting down trees, strip cutting of trees and the pollution of waterways as they dumped industrial wastes into rivers and into lakes gradually was catching up with them. It became clear that the air was getting dirtier, the water was getting undrinkable. The desire of a small but growing number of Americans to conserve the nation's diminishing natural resources and preserve its natural wonders gave birth to the modern environmental movement. Moved by descriptions of its majestic beauty, President Lincoln set aside California's Yosemite Valley as a natural preserve in 1864. Eight years later, Congress designated an isolated stretch of the Rockies called Yellowstone as the nation's first national park. Recognizing the potential business that could come from tourism, railroads quickly joined the national park movement petitioning Congress to set up other natural preserves. Soon Sequoia in California, Mount Rainier in Washington, and Glacier in Montana joined the growing list of national parks. Alarmed at the disappearance of once plentiful fish and game, gentlemen sportsmen organized the National Audubon Society and other wildlife organizations to lobby the states and Congress for the protection of wildlife and their habitat. Any fool can destroy trees. They cannot run away. God has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and a thousand straining, leveling tempests and floods. 
but he cannot save them from fools. Only Uncle Sam can do that. John Muir. Traveling the United States on foot, naturalist John Muir was appalled at the destruction he saw all around him and warned Americans about the precious gift they were losing. In 1892, Muir helped organize the Sierra Club, a group devoted to the preservation of the nation's disappearing wilderness areas. At that time, the federal government had little interest in preserving natural wonders. It did, however, want to conserve diminishing natural resources. In the 1890s, Congress set aside more than 40 million acres of forests as public reserves for future use. Here was the very heart of industrial America, the boast and pride of the richest and grandest nation ever seen on earth. And here was a scene so dreadfully hideous, so intolerably bleak and forlorn, that it reduced the whole aspiration of man to a macabre and depressing joke. Open privies, stables, and manure pits were notorious breeding grounds for disease. Garbage and wastes accumulated in the streets were dumped into rivers and lakes, where they killed countless fish and polluted drinking water. Typhoid, cholera, and other diseases swept through American cities, killing thousands. So in the 1880s, American cities began monumental public works projects, paving streets and constructing sewage systems. Campaigns for safe drinking water, garbage removal, and the reduction of smoke and noise brought significant improvements in public health. But the struggle between those favoring unregulated economic growth and those demanding a more livable environment would continue for generations to come. In the 35 years between the end of the Civil War and the turn of the century, the United States had emerged as an economic colossus. Blessed with abundant natural resources and the practical genius of its people, Americans had transformed the nation. This was a period of enormous uh, technological achievement. Think of a world today without steel, without anesthesia, without a telephone, without refrigeration. Our lives are so different, and so much of it goes back to inventions and uh, scientific breakthroughs in the late 19th century. The enormous economic growth during these years would not have been possible without the knowledge, skills, and labor of the more than 24 million immigrants who came to the United States between 1870 and 1940.